Welcome to the Wipeout HD Beginners Tutorial. The Wipeout series has always been known for the amount of dedication needed to truly get the most out of it, and this can be a daunting prospect for many newcomers. What I aim to demonstrate with this video is the bare basics needed for new players to get to grips with the game. This will include everything from the basic layout of the controls, all the way up to more advanced techniques such as pitch control and side shifting. I'll also be giving a quick explanation of the different game modes, as well as going through some of the weapon systems on the craft. So let's start off by taking a look at the basic controls for your craft. What I will describe in this section are the default controls that are available to you when you first start the game. It is possible to remap them if you find them uncomfortable. To steer the craft, use left and right on the D-pad or the analog stick. If you're feeling brave, you can also use the motion sensor and you can steer the craft by tilting left and right with the controller. Your main thruster is the X button. Hold down to accelerate and let go to bring the craft to a slow halt. It's also worth noting here that the thruster is analog. The harder you hold the button down, the quicker you'll accelerate. However, if you're not too keen on analog controls, I'll explain how to change it later on. Your craft is equipped with two air brakes, one on each side. They're operated by default using the L2 and R2 buttons. There's a number of ways that you can use your air brakes. If you hold both the L2 and R2 buttons down at the same time, your craft will slow down rapidly. The trouble is that in Wipeout you never want to stop moving. The air brakes here serve a different purpose. If you activate an air brake while the craft is moving, it will make it slow down on one side. This in turn will make it veer over. On its own, this effect really isn't much use. However, if you turn the craft while you're doing this, it will cause it to turn much more sharply than it could before. If you double tap either of the air brake buttons, it will cause the craft to shift in that direction. This technique is known as side shifting, and I'll be explaining some strategies for it later on. There are also a number of circumstances where it's useful to pitch the nose of your craft. On the D-pad or analog stick, push down to pull the nose up and up to push the nose down. You can also set the motion sensor to operate the pitch of the craft. In that case, tilting the controller up will pull the nose up and tilting it down will push the nose down. I'll explain some circumstances later where this is useful. In certain circumstances, you may find it useful to take a peek behind you. To do this on the default setup, hold down R1. If you're not too keen on the camera location, you can change it by using the triangle button. By default, the camera is set to near chase. One press of the triangle button, and the camera switches to far chase. Press the triangle button again and you'll enter internal view. One more press of the triangle button will return you to near chase. If your craft is holding a weapon pickup, you can absorb it by pressing the circle button. This will restore some of the craft's shield energy. Alternatively, if you want to activate the pickup, hit the square button. If you want to remap any of the controls, you can do so in the options menu. You'll also notice I didn't explain the function of L1, and this is because it's only applicable during specific game modes. So let's take a quick look at how you can customise your controls. Out of everything you see here, I would say that the most important one that newcomers need to be aware of is acceleration sensitivity. The bar that you see here represents just how pressure sensitive your thruster is. Pushing the slider all the way up to 100% will mean that your thruster is completely pressure sensitive. 
so for full acceleration you'd have to hold the button down very hard. The opposite is true if we set the slider to 10%. So in this state the thrust button is now almost completely digital. So now it doesn't matter how hard you push the button, you'll always accelerate at full speed. To be honest, there is absolutely no reason to have any analog function to the thruster. You either want it on or off. If you haven't done it already, make sure your acceleration sensitivity is set to 10%. It will make your life much easier. The air brake sensitivity bar works in exactly the same way, but where you put that is all down to a matter of preference. If you're feeling a bit mad and you want to have a go with the motion sensor, you can use this option to set it to operate pitch, steering or both. And the motion sensitivity bar works the same way as the other two. If you want, you can also remap any of the other controls. Again, this is all down to personal preference, but just to give you an example, I'll explain my own control scheme. Because I started off playing the original Wipeout games, I'm not really that keen on using triggers to operate the air brakes. So for me, the first thing was to change the air brakes to L1 and R1. Another reason is that it is a lot easier to side shift using the two smaller buttons rather than the triggers. I'm also used to having circle as fire and square as absorb. Again, this harks back to the original Wipeout games. The last two buttons are just personal preference. I've mapped look back to L2 and the game specific button to R2. Just to finish off the control section, I'll briefly explain the different functions of the game mode specific button. In Eliminator mode, the button will flip your craft round 180 degrees. In Detonator, it will activate your emergency EMP weapon. And if you hold the button down during a time trial or speed lap, it will invalidate your current lap and give you a turbo to help you quickly return to the starting line. In Wipeout HD, there are 12 teams you can race for. Every team's craft is unique in one way or another, and no matter what your play style, you should find one to suit you. However, it's likely that the first thing you'll notice is that there are seven choices for each team. If you're just starting out, only two will be available per team for the start of the game. You'll also notice you won't have access to four teams. You can unlock these teams and alternate colour schemes for the craft by playing through the campaign and by building up loyalty with each individual team. Each team will have two different versions of its craft. The four at the bottom of the list are different colour schemes of the original craft for the game. The stats you see underneath the image of the craft give you an indication of what it would be like to pilot. The speed stat is an indication of the craft's top speed. The thrust stat indicates how quickly a craft will accelerate. The handling stat gives an indication of how quickly the craft can turn. And finally the shield stat indicates how much damage the craft can withstand before it's destroyed. The top three in the list are different colour schemes of the Fury version of that craft. These redesigned versions were released with the Fury expansion pack and they've also been given small stat boosts. However, it's worth noting at this point that this does not render the original craft obsolete. The four stats you see here are just a general overview of the performance of the craft. There are plenty of other hidden stats that you don't get to see. For example, some craft might swing their back end out more than others in corners. Some may be able to maintain their speed better when going through a corner as well. So the small stat differences between the original and the Fury craft just mean that the Fury one has a slightly different feel. It doesn't mean that it is completely superior. The best idea would be to try both craft out and just see which one feels right for you. So let's see what difference these stats really make, starting with handling. Fizar tends to be a favourite for newcomers because it has a handling stat of 100. On the other hand, Piranha is one of the worst handling craft in the game. It of course makes up for this by having very high speed and shield stats. So let's compare the two by seeing how long they each take to turn a full circle. It's quite clear that the Fizar has a significant advantage over the Piranha when it comes to turning. Thrust is also a particularly important stat, especially at the start of the race when it can give you an early lead. The Piranha's low thrust means that despite its high top speed, it will take a while to get there. At the other end of the scale is Goteki 45. With a thrust stat of 100, there's nothing that will accelerate quicker. What you'll see here is a straight drag race between the Piranha and the Goteki, 
They'll begin from a standing position and race to the starting line. Over a short distance, the Kateki is a significant advantage. This also makes it one of the best teams to use to get away from the grid at the start of a race. If a ship's thrust helps it in the short term, then its top speed will help it in the long term. The original Fizar craft has one of the lowest top speeds in the game. So let's see how it fares compared to a craft with the highest top speed in the game, the Icarus. In this comparison, both craft will run through the Moa Therma loop at top speed. They'll follow the same path as closely as possible and no speed pads will be used. Unsurprisingly, the Icarus is the first to reach the end of the loop. Differences in top speed will be noticeable over the course of the whole race rather than just in the short term. During a normal race, your ship will be at the mercy of your opponent's weapons. It's your shields that will keep you in one piece. Out of all the teams, the Triacus is the most resilient, having the strongest shields in the game. The Icarus, on the other hand, despite having such a high speed rating, has very thin shields. In this comparison, both ships will suffer a hit from a missile. They will also drift into the sidewall from the impact. The Triakis took 14 damage from the missile impact. The Icarus, on the other hand, took 17, plus an extra one when it hit the sidewall. Now while there doesn't appear to be a major difference in shield strengths from the strongest to the weakest, this effect will be more noticeable over the course of an entire race. We've already established from the handling stat that certain craft are more difficult to turn than others. However, using the air brakes to turn means that even the heaviest craft can turn as quickly as the most agile. Think back to how slowly the Piranha turned on its own and now watch how quickly it's able to turn with use of the air brakes. So we've seen how the air brakes actually work, but now we need to see them used in a race environment. First of all, let's see an example of how a high handling craft tackles a technical circuit. This sharp corner series on Sabenko Climb appears near the start of the track. On Venom class, a Fizar can navigate it without any use of the air brakes. For a high handling craft like the Fizar, this was fairly straightforward. However, if we attempt to do the same thing in a Piranha, the results should be obvious. While it was just able to clear the first corner, the second two resulted in a heavy wall impact. So the only way you can get a heavy handling craft like the Piranha around a circuit like this is to use the air brakes to aid in turning. Here's the same sequence again, but this time the air brakes have been used to help through the corners. So using slight taps of the air brakes allowed the Piranha to navigate this section at near full speed without any impact with the wall. Another example is the final corner series at Ubermall, which even on Venom class can be very difficult. As before, let's first of all see the Fizar tackle the corner series without any use of the air brakes. Now let's see the Piranha try to attempt the same thing. While it enters the first corner okay, it's unable to change direction quickly enough to enter the second corner and as a result slams into the back wall. So of course the only way for the Piranha to tackle this corner series is to use the air brakes. Let's see how that's done. As the craft turns in, a slight tap of the right air brake will pull the craft further into the corner. Once you're through, hit left and then tap the left air brake to swing the craft into the second corner. 
The air brakes do take a bit of getting used to, but you need to get the hang of them if you're going to compete on the higher speed classes. It's one thing being able to navigate a circuit, but it's something else being able to do it in the most efficient way possible. You need to try and work out a racing line around each circuit. This indicates the path you need to take to navigate the circuit in the quickest possible time. Firstly, let's see an example of how not to do it. This Kyrex is going to navigate this part of the Talon's junction track simply by sticking to the centre of the track. Despite the fact there were no impacts with the walls, this is a very inefficient way of navigating this circuit and is an example of a poor racing line. So in general it's worth remembering, perfect laps do not necessarily make fast laps. So let's see how we can improve our racing line and navigate this track more efficiently. As with any racing game, the best way to tackle a corner is by going outside, inside, outside. What this means is that you approach a corner from the outside, as you turn you aim for the apex bringing it to the inside and then you exit the corner on the outside again. This method allows you to navigate the corner in the straightest path possible, thus losing you less speed through the corner. So let's see that section of track again, but this time navigating each corner going as close to the apex as possible. Now this is by no means a perfect racing line, but it is much better than the previous one. To illustrate how much time you save with a good racing line, let's compare those two runs side by side. As you can see here, the craft with the better racing line has a significant lead. A good racing line can make a big difference over the course of a race. Side shifting can be a tricky technique, but once you master it, it will save you a lot of time on your laps. We've already seen that double tapping the air brake will trigger a side shift, so let's see some examples of where this can be used. The corner you see here is just a straightforward right-hander, however it's quickly followed by a left. There's also a speed pad just after the exit on the right-hand side. So to set yourself up for the next corner and to hit that speed pad, you'd have to ignore all the basic rules of a racing line and exit on the inside. The trouble is, in order to do that you'd have to turn quite hard, which is going to affect your speed through the corner. Side shifting has no effect on your forward speed, so by using this technique you can exit the corner on the inside while maintaining the speed you would have had had you used a straighter racing line. So to begin with, I'm going to tackle the corner as though I'm aiming to exit on the outside as I normally should. Just above the apex, you can now see the speed pad I was talking about. If I just wanted to go straight for it, I would need to turn quite sharply, which is going to lose me speed. However, by side shifting over to the right, I can continue turning at my current rate and I'll still hit the speed pad. The main advantage is that I have now exited the corner much more quickly than if I'd have turned very sharply. Here's another example. This time I'm going to use a side shift to try and straighten my path through a right-left chicane. Start off by entering the right-hander as close to the apex as possible. You can see the apex of the next corner ahead of you. If I were to straighten my path out now, I would go straight into the left-hand wall. So I'll need to turn a little bit more if I'm going to clear that apex, which in turn is going to slow me down. However, if I side shift over to the right, I now have a clear path into the second corner so I can now straighten the craft out and enter the left-hander. So overall this has reduced how tightly I need to turn and it's kept my speed to a maximum. Side shifting is also a good way to recover in a hairpin corner if it looks like you're going to clip the wall on exit. Here I'm going to try and follow a standard racing line through the Talon's Junction hairpin. From here it's easy to see that I'm not turning sharply enough and I'm going to hit the outside wall. However, while I'm turning, I can right side shift to pull me away.
Barrel rolling is a technique you have to master if you want to have any chance of beating the Elite AI or some of the more experienced racers online. Of course there's much more to it than just being a fancy trick. When you land after performing a successful barrel roll, you'll get a small speed boost. There is of course a downside to this. For every successful one you manage to pull off, it will cost you 15 shield energy. Anytime your craft leaves the track, you have an opportunity to perform a barrel roll. Once you're in the air, hit left right left or right left right to perform a barrel roll. This needs to be done very quickly. You don't have to be going over massive jumps in order to pull off barrel rolls. You just need your craft to leave the track for long enough for you to perform the manoeuvre. If you come across a sequence of small jumps, it's possible to perform consecutive barrel rolls in very quick succession. This will give you a major speed boost. However, your shield energy will also take quite a big hit, so you need to assess whether it's a good idea to do it. However, it is worth remembering that on speed laps and time trials, you have infinite shield energy, so therefore, you can perform as many rolls as you like. In some cases, just pulling the nose up as you go over a raised section in the track will be enough to give you enough height to roll. The example shown here is the peak at the top of Sabenko Climb. If you can pull the nose up quickly enough, you'll gain just enough time to pull off a roll. Pilot Assist allows me to provide you with the best piece of advice I have to make you a better player. DON'T USE IT! <clears throat> Sorry about that. The whole point behind Pilot Assist was that it was meant to be an aid for new players who were having difficulty navigating courses. Anytime it looked like he was about to hit a wall, an autopilot would kick in and steer your craft away. In theory this would allow even a complete novice to navigate the most difficult circuits with ease. Just to illustrate this, the run you're about to see is a piranha tackling one lap of the complex Sabenko climb circuit. The air brakes and side shift are never used, and this is on the fastest speed class in the game, Phantom Class. It should be clear to see that with Pilot Assist activated, there's very little that you have to do in order to navigate a craft around a circuit. So the question really is why shouldn't you use it? And this boils down to three major points. The first and most major problem with Pilot Assist is that it actually slows you down. Every time it needs to be activated, your top speed will drop dramatically. Secondly, if Pilot Assist needs to be activated, it's because you're drifting too wide in corners, which means that your racing line is not good. This, coupled with the speed drop, is going to lose you even more time through corners. Finally, Pilot Assist has a habit of activating when you don't want it to, and its effect can be quite aggressive. This example shows the final few corners of Sabenko Climb. The craft tackles the first corner very well, it only looks like it's going to lightly brush the outer wall on exit. However, this is enough to force the Pilot Assist to kick in, and it will violently push the craft away. This forces the craft over to the opposite wall, where the same effect happens. This pinballing effect can be difficult to recover from, and it will lose you a significant amount of time. Here's another example of the unpredictability of pilot assist. As a result of the previous intervention, the line going into this chicane series is slightly off. The craft clips the first apex on the right, but for some reason the pilot assist doesn't kick in. The impact pushes the craft over to the left, but it's not enough to significantly disrupt the racing line. However, as you approach the following apex on the left, the pilot assist has other ideas. It forces the craft away from the apex quite violently, and as a result, it almost throws it off the track. In general, if you're looking to improve as a player in this game, Pilot Assist really does more harm than good. Not only does it slow you down, or not work as you want it to on occasions, it also means that you're not learning how to use the air brakes or side shift. Without those techniques and relying solely on Pilot Assist, your chances of defeating the Elite AI or some of the Elite Pilots online is next to nothing. So all that's really left to be said about Pilot Assist is exactly what I said at the start. Don't use it. Shield energy is what protects your craft during a race. It's also used to activate barrel rolls. The blue meter at the top of the screen tells you how much shield energy your craft has remaining. 
hitting the sidewalls, colliding with other competitors, leaving the track, barrel rolling or suffering weapon impacts will cause you to lose shield energy. The amount of energy lost is determined by the craft's shield stat, except for barrel rolling which will always cost you 15 shield energy. The game will give you a warning when you start to run low on shield energy. When your meter drops to 20, an alarm will sound and the meter will start flashing red. If your shield energy drops to 5, a faster alarm will sound. Finally, if your shield energy drops to 0, your craft will explode. In standard races in single player, this will be the end of the race. However, online, you will respawn. To prevent this happening, you will need to absorb weapon pickups to restore shield energy. You can pick up weapons by running over active speed pads. If you press the circle button, the weapon will be absorbed and some of your shield energy will be restored. Different weapons will restore different amounts of shield energy. You can check how much an individual weapon will restore by checking the absorb stat next to the energy meter. Aside from the racing, the Wipeout series has also always been known for its lovely gratuitous violence. Flying over an active weapon pad will equip your craft with one of a number of weapons. These are either defensive weapons which have effects such as shielding your craft or giving you speed boosts, or offensive weapons which are designed to deal damage to other craft and to slow them down. The amount of damage that each weapon can inflict is given by the damage stat to the left of the shield gauge. So let's have a look at the individual weapon systems and what they actually do. Activating an autopilot will put control of the craft into the hands of the AI for 5 seconds. While active, the AI will effortlessly pilot even the most complex part of a circuit. The turbo will give your craft a large speed boost straight ahead. It's best used on long straights, however it can also be used over small peaks to gain height to barrel roll. Activating a shield will render your craft completely invulnerable for 5 seconds. This however does not cancel energy loss as a result of barrel rolling. The leech beam drains your opponent's shield energy and uses it to restore your own. A thin reticule will appear over the target when they're in range. When it turns red, activate the weapon to latch the beam onto them. The link will last for 3 seconds, however if your opponent activates a shield or moves out of range the beam will deactivate automatically. So in general it's best to use a leech beam on an opponent that is just in front of you. The cannon is an ammunition based rapid fire weapon. Each pickup comes with 30 rounds. Hold down the square button to fire and it will hit anything in front of you for as long as you have ammunition remaining. The cannon doesn't do a great deal of damage, however it's very good at slowing down your opponent's craft and the impacts will also make it difficult to control. So the best time to use it will be as your opponent is just about to enter a corner. It can really play havoc with their racing line. You don't have to use all the rounds at once. If you have any remaining, you can target another craft or you can absorb whatever's left to restore a small amount of shield energy. Rockets are simple weapons but are surprisingly effective. Activating the weapon will cause three unguided rockets to fly down the track ahead of you in a spread pattern. If they hit, the rockets are moderately damaging, however they have a massive slowing effect. If a craft gets hit by more than one of these, it will be a good couple of seconds before they can get going again. As they're unguided, rockets are generally not best used in corners, however up close range or on a straight they can be very effective. Missiles are single shot guided weapons that are very difficult to get away from. They deal a fair amount of damage and have a moderate slowing effect, but their main feature is that they home in on your target. When you have a target in range, a reticle will appear over them. When it turns red, activate the weapon and the missile will chase them. The missile itself doesn't have a great turning circle, but it can bounce off of walls, making it surprisingly agile. It is a particularly versatile weapon, being effective on most places on a track. However, despite its agility, the missile finds it difficult to keep up with opponents entering complex corner series or hairpins. The 
Plasma Bolt is by far the most powerful single shot weapon in the game. When activated, the bolt takes a second to charge up before being released directly in front of the craft. The charging time makes the plasma very difficult to aim. However, if it does hit anything, the results are devastating. Quake is the personal favourite of many players. Activating it sends a massive energy wave hurtling down the track ahead of you. It may not be particularly damaging and only has a moderate slowing effect, but it has an enormous range and is impossible to avoid. The only way to get out of the way of this weapon is to be out of range or to activate a shield. It's best to use this when you have a large number of craft entering a corner series. So far, all of the weapons that we have seen have only been useful for opponents in front of you. Dropping a set of mines will give a nasty surprise to anybody following directly behind. Activating the weapon will drop five mines in quick succession directly behind your craft. Hitting one mine won't really do a great deal. However, hit all five and you'll suffer considerable damage and a major slowing effect. Mines are best laid through the middle of chicanes, across the track in complex corners, or on blind sections where it's very difficult to see the track ahead. I'll use rear view here to show you how the mines are deployed. The bomb is a slightly more indiscriminate version of the mines. Activating the weapon will drop a single bomb directly behind you. Any opponent flying too close to the bomb will cause it to violently explode, dealing moderate damage and throwing them over to one side of the track. Unlike the mines, however, the bomb has a blast radius. Any craft that are near to the bomb when it goes off will suffer a small amount of damage and a small slowing effect. Another difference from mines is that bombs tend to stay on the track for a much longer time. For instance, a bomb dropped from the back of the pack may stay on the track long enough to hit the leader on the following lap. It is worth mentioning though that you are not immune to the effects of your own bombs, so be careful not to drop a bomb if there is an opponent directly behind you. On some circuits the track may be sloped over to one side. If this is the case, then the weight of your craft will tend to pull it down towards the lower side of the track. Bear in mind that in this demonstration, the craft is not steering at all, it's simply being pulled down under its own weight. So when you're flying over an inclined section of track, you'll need to keep lightly steering over to the upper edge of the track to keep it moving in a straight line. If the track is inclined towards the inside of a corner, then that corner will be much easier to navigate as your weight will be helping pull the craft around. Try not to overdo it on the air brakes when going through a corner like this, otherwise you might find yourself hitting the inside wall as you come out. I mentioned in the control section that you can pitch your craft using up and down on the D-pad or analog stick. The whole point of pitching is to determine how much your craft sticks to the track. Pitching the nose down will cause the craft to grip the track more tightly, making it more difficult for the craft to jump into the air. Pitching the nose up will loosen the craft's grip on the track, allowing it to jump into the air more easily. I'm going to show you a couple of examples where pitching the nose is useful. Take a look at this first scenario on the second straight of an alpha pass. There is a small peak in the track ahead. The craft is going to activate a turbo just before it reaches this peak. Without any alteration of the pitch, the craft will simply go straight over the peak without gaining any significant height. Let's take a look at the same scenario again, only this time the craft will pitch its nose up before engaging the turbo. So just by pitching the nose up, the craft gained more than enough height to perform a barrel roll. In fact, it was going so fast when it went over the second peak, it also gained enough height to roll again. There are also certain occasions where you want your craft to stay as close to the track as possible. This corner on Shengyu Project is an inclined corner. However, unlike most of the other corners in the game, this one is inclined outwards. So instead of the weight of your craft pulling it towards the inside of the corner, this time it will be pulling it towards the outside. The effect that this has is that as you turn against your weight, your craft will constantly be trying to jump into the air, making the corner very difficult to navigate. To 
counter this effect, hold the nose of your craft down as you go through the corner. This will anchor the craft to the track and allow you to navigate the corner much more easily. It's not always a good idea to try for as much height as possible when you're going for a barrel roll. If you spend too long in the air, air resistance will begin to slow your craft down. Also, while your craft is in the air, it's much more difficult to control, so ideally you want to get it back on the track as quickly as possible. And finally, there's a much more fundamental reason. Have a look what happens here when I use a turbo over this peak while pulling the nose up on the final straight at Ubermont. Holding the nose down when you go over a peak like this will limit the amount of height that you gain. As a result, you do gain enough height to barrel roll, but you drop back onto the track very quickly afterwards. This is a much more efficient and safer way of doing things. You'll learn through experience where the best places to pitch up and down will be, and in the end they will have an effect on your race times. Boost starting has become a common feature of many arcade racing games. If you hit the thruster as soon as the countdown says go, you'll receive a speed boost off the line. The magnitude of this boost is affected by the thrust stat of the craft. There are four different speed classes available to you in the game. Venom class is the slowest, and it's likely to be the speed class that newcomers will spend the most time on. Courses are easy to navigate, and in most cases can be done without the use of air brakes. Flash class speeds things up a little bit. You'll find yourself needing to use air brakes more often, and possibly even a little bit of side shift. On Rapier class, things are starting to get very quick indeed. You'll need to be very comfortable with your use of the air brakes at this speed class, and also you'll need to have a familiarity with the circuits. Phantom class is as fast as it gets in normal racing. To do well at this speed class, you need to be able to control all aspects of your craft without even thinking about it. Air brake and side shift use should be second nature and you need to be thinking at least one corner ahead at all times. Finally, to finish off with, let's talk about the different game modes. Single race mode is a straight race against eight opponents. The number of laps varies depending on speed class. Venom class races are three laps, Flash and Rapier are 4 laps, and Phantom Class is over 5 laps. Tournament mode sets up a sequence of single races where points are awarded depending on position. The player at the end of the tournament that has the most number of points wins. In both single race and tournament mode you can specify whether you want to use weapons or not. Time trial mode puts you against the clock, trying to complete a full race in as quick a time as possible. The number of laps for each speed class is the same as for single race. The big difference here is that you're given infinite shield energy and a turbo at the start of each lap. There's no AI opponents to worry about here. All you're concerned about is completing the race in as quick a time as possible. The extension to this is speed lap mode. Instead of trying to achieve a fast race time, in speed lap mode you're given 99 laps to try and achieve as fast a lap time as you can. It's also the perfect mode to practice any tracks you're unfamiliar with. If racing's not your thing, Eliminator is all about the weapons. The idea in Eliminator is simply to deal as much damage to your opponents as you can. Points are rewarded for inflicting damage on opposing craft or for eliminating them entirely. If you or your opponents are eliminated, points will be lost but you'll respawn straight away. There are no defensive weapons in this mode. Absorbing a weapon will cause a small shield to be erected around your craft for about two seconds. The only way to restore shield energy is to complete a lap. You can also flip your craft 180 degrees to fire your weapons backwards.
If you want to experience speeds that even Phantom Class can't offer, then Zone Mode is for you. In this mode, your thruster is jammed on and there's no way to slow down. The purpose is simply to last as long as you can. At the start of a zone race, your craft is initially going slower than it would in Venom Class. However, you gain a zone every 10 seconds which will slightly increase your speed. Inevitably, as your craft gets faster and faster, it becomes more difficult to control and you'll begin to lose shield energy as you hit the walls. You can restore your craft's shield energy by running perfect zones. Ultimately though, it's only a matter of time before you run out of shield energy and your craft is destroyed. The question is though, how long can you keep it going for? Zone Battle is a competitive extension of Zone Mode. The idea is to be the first to reach a particular zone, set at the start of the race. Unlike in Standard Zone Mode, you can manually increase your zone by using energy accumulated from zone packs. For a full explanation on how Zone Battle works, I have a separate tutorial video on my channel. Detonator Mode is another single player extension of Zone Mode. Each race only lasts for 14 laps, each one faster than the previous. However, this time the track is littered with mines and bombs. The idea behind Detonator Mode is to destroy as many of these mines and bombs as you can using the cannon mounted on your craft. If you can chain mines together, this will increase your score even faster. And if you find yourself in a tricky spot, you're armed with an emergency EMP weapon that can wipe out all mines ahead of you for a short distance. As with Zone Battle, I have a separate tutorial for the ins and outs of Detonator Mode. Ultimately, in a game like Wipeout, the only way you can really get better as a player is to practice, practice and practice some more. But sometimes when you're new to a game like this, you do need a bit of a helping hand. Hopefully this video has provided a more accessible means of getting to grips with the basics of the game. And if you can get the hang of these basic techniques, it won't be very long before you're hammering Phantom Class like the best of us. Thanks very much for watching and I hope you enjoy what is ultimately a very rewarding game.